Uh, so if you take your notes out, and I want to speak to you today on Father's Day, go to God. We're going to look at three ways to strengthen and to support and to secure your breakthroughs. Uh, if you're a guest with us today, 2018 is the year of breakthrough, and I've been doing everything I do is about breakthrough this year. This morning, I want to look at how can you continue to become diligent in the constant maintaining of the ground that you've gained as we've been looking at these previous principles that we've talked about. This is what it actually means to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. That you put into practice these biblical principles is how you take up your cross, Jesus said, on a daily basis, put to death your own selfish ambition, and follow Jesus moment by moment. So if you look in your notes down at number 11, this is where we develop an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. The G in our acronym breakthrough represents how to build and grow through the breakthrough God gives you. G stands for go to God. Through a daily time with God in prayer, meditation, and memorization of the scripture in order to know God and his will for my life and to receive his power to fulfill it. This is based on Mark 11, 14, 38. Would you read this out loud with me? Let's begin. Keep alert and pray. Otherwise, temptation will overpower you. For though the spirit is willing enough, the body is weak. He's saying that it's human nature to fail. It's human nature to be inconsistent and to compromise and to keep going back to those things that mess us up, even though we know that they do. It's human nature to let past problems revisit us. Our old hurts and habits and hang-ups come back to haunt us. So the Bible's very clear in saying you and I need to have safeguards. That's what this teaching today, this is what this step, go to God, is all about. And there's three safeguards that I want to help you and I learn how to maintain your breakthroughs. Does that make sense? Yeah. That once you get a breakthrough, and that can be just an incremental move forward, whenever you make some progression, how do you hold your ground so you don't slip back and fall and give up that ground? So look at the first one. This is how to strengthen your breakthroughs. Number one, be, have a consistent personal evaluation. Consistent personal uh, evaluation. Look at Lamentations 3.40. It says this. Instead, let us test and examine our ways. Let us turn again in repentance to the Lord. So we're to have this constant turning. Really, the lead idea in Christianity, once you understand that he loves you, we, we really have one message, and that is to repent. That means to turn away from our own selfish inclinations and to turn towards him, to return home to your father. So what do you do? Letter A, what do I examine? I want to give you four kinds of evaluations or four kinds of inventories. Here's the first one. Take a physical inventory. You ask the question, and this might sound strange to some of you, what is my body telling me? Your body is actually a barometer to what's happening inside of you. If you have tense muscles on an ongoing basis, guess what? You're probably under stress. If you have chronic headaches or back aches, what is that saying to you? And about the stress and the burden you could be carrying or something out of whack or out of order in your body. Your body's a barometer. In other words, it's a warning light that maybe something is wrong. And so periodically you need to stop maybe in the middle of your day and say, what is my body saying to me? Am I hungry? Am I tired? Am I fatigued? Am I stressed out? I told a story in the first service. My dad was a really hard worker. I love my dad. <clears throat> he was a definitely a, a hero for me growing up. And uh, 
he was president of Eugene Bible College, and they just secured a large piece of property for the school. So he said, come on, son, you're going to go with me. I, I would work for him from 6 in the morning till 7 or 8 o'clock at night, and he was a big spender. He'd give me five bucks and pay for my lunch. And we ate at Taco Bell's, and tacos cost 25 cents a taco. So if I was a good boy, I'd get two. And he had me on the back of his sprayer, and we were spraying cherry trees. And all of a sudden, I remember, he got hit, he, he got hit by this branch that he didn't see, and it knocked him off the tractor. And he was also pulling a disc, rotating blades, went right over his leg, cut the inside muscle of the calf, and it was just hanging outside his leg. And I'm sitting here thinking, we're going to go to the hospital. No. He jumps off the thing, off the tractor. He sticks it back inside his leg, takes a towel, and ties it up and says, get back on the tractor. We got work to do. You know, that blew me away. I never knew what happened. I don't know if he went to the hospital. I don't know if he got the thing sewed up. I just know he, he lived. <laughs> I would work with him. We'd be on two- and three-story buildings painting. He'd fall off those stupid things. And I'm sitting here going, he, he's got to break his back. About 10 minutes, he'd get up. I said, where are you going? He says, I'm, going, I'm climbing back up the ladder. We got work to do. So <clears throat> he taught me an incredible work ethic, and I'm thankful to him that he taught me that sometimes you have to play when you're hurt. Mm -hmm. But he didn't listen to his body. So he was way overweight, and he was always in pain. My dad never had a day of no pain. So I've learned, well, you've got to listen to your body. I know there are people here you need to eat every two hours. There's some of you, you'll go five, six, seven hours without eating. This is just crazy. And then you crash and you wonder why you're crashing. It just doesn't make sense. You got to take care of yourself. You got to listen to your body. You know, there's a new word up, uh, hangry. <laughs> that people, when they're hungry, they get angry. And so you say, what's your problem? I'm hangry. Well, for crying out loud, eat something. <laughs> you're not listening to your body. That's one inventory to take. This is the first time I'll be 64 at the end of this month. You guys, I am completely out of pain. I have no pain. I've walked in pain. Well, listen, I, I didn't say for you to be bad. I'm just saying, I've been in pain all my life. I could hardly walk. I could hardly get out of bed. I've been hit by trucks. I've done motorcycles going 85 miles an hour. I've fallen out of trees. I've fallen off a roof. I should be crippled and dead, actually. But... I've learned to listen to my body, and I do things that some of you might think are funny and ridiculous, but I'm out of pain. And I take no medication, I take no prescription drugs, and I'm out of pain. That's just fantastic. I don't know if you know this, but every communion, I would dump communion on myself. And some of you thought I was just kind of spastic. But what would happen is, because I tore my shoulder and I never got it fixed, like my dad, my arm would lock up, and it happened every month. And you'll go, oh, you, you, don't you remember? Evidently not. And I'd go like this, and it would lock, and then I'd dump it on myself. Every communion for several years. <laughs> You're not very smart, Pastor. <laughs> but it doesn't happen anymore because I got the pain taken care of. Number two, take an emotional inventory. How am I feeling right now? Am I allowing my real feelings to surface or am I just pushing them down? Pushing down your real feelings is like shaking up a Coke bottle and not taking the cap off. It's going to blow eventually. So it's important to do what I call a heart check. We use the acronym there, H, a heart. H is am I hurting? And, and take the surf vip acronym. Am I hurting spiritually? <laughs> Am I hurting emotionally? Am I hurting relationally? Am I hurting financially? Am I hurting voca uh, vo uh, vocationally? Am I hurting intellectually? Am I hurting physically? Do this every day. Letter E, am I exhausted? Some of us think we're going to get brownie points for being exhausted. You're not. You're going to burn your adrenals out. You're going to die early. 
There's no rewards for exhaustion. But some of us grew up in a home where that was a value. What's wrong with dad? He's exhausted because he's worked all day. You know what they should have said is, well, because he's not doing his evaluations, he's not keeping track of himself, he's hangry, he's doing all this stuff. It was like, oh, isn't that great? I want to grow up and be just like dad. I love my dad. I'm not banging on my dad. My dad, I thank God he's my, he was my father. Letter A, am I angry? I'm going to do a series after this one, and I'm entitling it, I am not angry, exclamation <laughs> point. Every time I teach on this subject, people will come up to me. First, they're angry that I'm dealing with it. <laughs> and secondly, they'll say, I never knew. I never knew. They'll say they're exhausted, they'll say they're irritated, they'll say they're annoyed, they'll say they're agitated, but they won't cop to angry. Because the Bible says be not angry. So if I'm angry, I'm sinning. So I just will say I don't, I'm not angry. And my dash lights on the head is all going on. I've got stress, I've got headaches, I have back aches, my bro my relationships are all broken up, but thank God I will not confess to anger. So I'm going to do one. I am not angry. <laughs> Letter R. Do I resent anyone? This is the biggest one, one of the biggest ones for relationship brokenness and for physical stress and tension. T. Am I tense or anxious? That's how you do a heart inventory. Look at number three. Take a relational inventory. Am I at peace with everyone? If not, that eternal, internal conflict is going to keep you back, and it's going to hold you back from breakthroughs. My hunch in a group this size, there are some of us, the reason we're not getting the breakthroughs, the reason our relationships aren't more intimate, the reason our, we're not getting those promotion at jobs, is because our relationships are out of order, and we're unaware of it, or we just don't want to pay attention to it. But relationships will make you or break you. Did you know most people who get fired from jobs, it's not because they didn't have the IQ, and it's not because they didn't have the skill per se. They didn't have the emotional, what they call EQ. They didn't know how to deal with their emotions, and they don't know how to deal with people. And so the company, the person, whoever's in charge goes, it's just too costly to have this person on because they keep everything all riled up. So EQ is very important along with your relationship. There are some of us in our lives that you have conflict with these people. They might be dead or they live thousands of miles away, but you're letting them live in your mind free of rent. They might have been gone or moved away 15 years ago. She could live a 1,000 miles away, but you wake up thinking about her and how she betrayed you and how she hurt you. Maybe he, he wasn't a good father. Many of us here, you could just recite all the negative things about your dad and about your mom, and you haven't forgiven them, and you haven't let it go. This will hold you back from your breakthroughs. Number four, take a spiritual inventory. This is where you ask yourself, am I relying on God in every area of my life? Most of us here, if you're a believer, you'd probably just say, oh, yeah, yeah. Are you really sure, though? Just a litmus test. You might check and see how many fears do you have in your life. Every area that you have active fear going on, you are not trusting God in that area. Because perfect love does what? It, it pushes, it casts out, it puts fears out of the way. You do an evaluation, you celebrate your successes, you confess your failures, but be grateful for what you have. Look at Galatians 6, 4, and 5. Be sure to do what you should, for you will then enjoy the personal satisfaction of having done your work well, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. For we are all responsible for our own conduct. 
when you take these evaluations, when you do these inventories, you can say, I'm grateful that God is working and I'm seeing progress in my life. Then you might ask this question, well, when do I do my evaluations? When, I, when do I do these checks? Well, number one, spot checks. Any time during the day, you can do a heart check. Am I hurting? Am I exhausted? Any one of them. Am I angry? Do I resent anyone? Am I tense or anxious? What are my emotions saying? Am I actually turning to God in this right now? Have you noticed how fast your mind and your emotions can shift just so quickly? You see somebody or somebody cuts you off or whatever it is, and all of a sudden you just slam into panic mode or anger mode or fight or flight or freeze or fawn mode and you're just sitting going ah. so spot checks are really important do I have any relational conflict keep short accounts with God don't let the sins stockpile it doesn't take 16 pages because you have had short accounts people who have never done a moral inventory it can take hours it can take days it can take weeks. But once you've done that, once you get it down and, and you start working on it, the goal is just keep short of cancer. Number two, daily review. At the end of the day, find a quiet spot, review your day, confess your failures, celebrate your victories, look at your day. And then third is an annual review. Maybe you take a day or two, you go away, and you take, take some time to just look at the past year, look at your life, and prepare for the new one. So that's the first, how you strengthen your breakthroughs. You take consistent personal evaluation. Here's how you support your breakthroughs. Number two, meditate on God's word. Meditation is a good biblical word that has been co-opted by a lot of other people. It simply means you slow down long enough to listen to God. Busyness stifles breakthrough and growth. This really is the secret to spiritual strength. And I find that Satan finds nothing, Satan fights nothing harder in my life than this issue. He wants to make sure I'm so distracted and there's so much noise that I don't take time to be alone with God, quiet time. Satan has three tools. You might write these down. He'll use noise, he'll use crowds, and he'll use hurriedness. Have you ever been around someone who's always in a hurry? I mean, it can be exasperating. There's just idle movement all the time. It just wears me out being around somebody like that. Notice Psalms 1, 1 through 3. All the joys for those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the river, breaking, bearing fruit each season. Their leaf never, neither withers, and they prosper in all they do. And uh, I know I sound like a broken record. I, I, it's this. Here's how we learn to meditate. Some of you have been here a long time and you're not doing it yet, and I'm just going to keep saying it until as many of you get on board as possible. And this is our Bible bookmark. Today, uh, we've already read 1 Kings 20, 21, 2 Chronicles 17, Colossians 3. Profound truths in here. And we use the SOAP acronym. You read those passages, then... Most likely, there'll be a scripture. It might be one or two verses, might be a paragraph, might be a chapter. It just jumps out at you. That's the Holy Spirit saying, I'm getting your attention in this. Okay? Because I had one person say, well, you know, I don't do it because I start to read it, and I just want to sit in camp, and I want to spend three hours. So I say, so you, do, you don't do it at all. That isn't the wisest decision to make. If you will read through this bookmark with me every year, you will get through the entire Bible once and the New Testament twice. And I said, what you can do is, as you read it, 
Because she, she looked at me and she said, well, I, I, I just quit because I wanted to drill down in this. Did you drill down in it? No, I just quit. There you go. Read it. Next year, it might say drill down again. If you don't, next year, if you might hear the Holy Spirit say, not, 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 drill down, then you can. But the whole time, you are putting God's word and God's principles into your heart and into your mind. Repetition is the mother of skill, church. Someone said, that. well, you just know the scripture so well. It's not that I know it so well. I just read it every year. I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. I just keep reading it. And you read, for God so loved the world, 50 to 100 times, hopefully it's going to drop. It's going to go from here to here. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's how you meditate. You get a verse and also memorization. You know, I'm, I'm memorizing Psalms 119. It's not easy. It's tough sledding. But, man, I'm telling you, I wake up in the middle of the night at 3 o'clock in the morning, and uh, all of a sudden, Psalms 119, boom. You know, verse 9, how can a young person stay pure? By obeying his word. Verse 11, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. This is how you meditate. You take scripture and you just keep rolling it around in your mind. I've said this to you. Meditation is a form. Uh, worry is a form of meditation. What is worry? You take that one thing you're fearful about. I haven't paid my bill. They're going to take my home. I haven't paid my bill. They're going to take my home. I haven't paid my bill. They're going to take your home. And you can have a breakdown right there. Call in sick for sick day. Because you made yourself so sick. So what you do is you take that worry principle and you put it into meditation. You take one scripture or one truth from what you've read and you just roll it around in your mind over and over and over and over and over again. And you just let the word of God speak to you. And can I say this? You'll never grow. You'll never have the breakthroughs God has for you. Until you take the time to meditate and let his word become the driving force in your life. Uh, Whitney, she couldn't sing this song live, so she's uh, just put a new song on a video, and it's called Running Home. It's all about today. Run home. Would you listen to it with me? Shaking off these dry bones Been lost in a field too long Now my father calls me home It's his voice I'll follow Your perfect love will drive out fear No more doubt, there's greatness here Victory, I am free You soar faster than I can fall I'm letting go
That really is what Father's Day is about. It's coming home. Yeah. It's running home to God. And if your dad's still alive, hopefully God can work it out where you can come back and be in connection with him. And let me just say this about that. What's difficult if you've had a poor fathering experience and if your father abused you at any level what happens is Satan uses that to get us to fixate on the negative things that he did. But here's the truth. Any strength that you have in you, a lot of it came from your dad, even if he was a bad dad. It took me 34 years to figure that out. I hated my father. I hated him for what he did. Even though I loved him and even though I idolized him in a way, I if there was time where I had this sheer hate because of the pain and the, the betrayal I had experienced. And that blocked me from seeing my own strength. When we're in birthday situations and people go around, they'll say, here's what you mean to me. I'm telling you, every trait, there's usually 15 to 20. I can point and go, Ed, 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 Ed. And my point is, your resentment and potential hate Anger and hatred for your daddy blocks you from seeing some of the gifts and some of the strengths that God was still able to place through you, through him. This is why being willing to come home, both spiritually, but also with your own father, if you can, meaning if he's still alive, if he's not, you can still come home to him in your own heart and make sure that you deal with those issues. Does that make sense? Uh, number three, prayer. Prayer is whatever God can do. And we've been told that nothing is impossible with God. So look at Matthew chapter 6, 9 to 15. This is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, may your name be honored. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. Give us our food for today and forgive us our sins, just as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive you. I want you to notice a couple of things here. First, you, 
He doesn't say what you should pray. He says this is how you should pray. It does not say this is the what. He says this is the how. Well, what does that mean to us? It means it's a model. Every now and then, people who come from traditions where they recited the Lord's Prayer every Sunday. And they'll say, why don't we do it every Sunday here? Well, because a couple of verses right before this prayer, Jesus says, don't just repeat ritual prayer like vain repetition. See, this was not a prayer to become a ritual. Because what happens with most rituals, at some point, you get bored with them and you can say them and your mind is turned off and you're not meaning now what you're saying. This is not what you should pray. This is a how you should pray. And if you look at this, at the Lord's, uh, some call it the Lord's Prayer. Uh, I like those that have penned it's the disciples' prayer. They said, how do we pray? Jesus said, let me teach you how to pray. Our Father in heaven, may your name be honored. This is what we know is the prayer of connection. You're praying to the God of the universe who happens to be your daddy. And he loves you deeply. I become clear that I'm not God, but my loving heavenly father is. You realize God is God. Verse 10, may your kingdom come soon. May your will be done here on earth just as it is in heaven. This is the prayer of surrender. If you're praying unsurrendered prayers, they won't get answered. I embrace his will for all of my life. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done here on earth. Prayer of surrender. I embrace his will for all the life in my areas of surf then. Verse 11. Give us our food for today. This is the prayer of provision. Where you take this, the acronym surf then. Spiritual life, emotional, relational, financial, vocational, intellectual, physical. You ask God for your daily provision in each one of those areas. If you will do this, this will change your life. And forgive us our sins just as we have forgiven those who sin against us. This is the prayer for forgiveness and reconciliation. And don't let us yield to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is the prayer for protection. You can see the process of breakthrough as part of the disciples' prayer that God gave to us. I've asked Rick to come and, and share his example of how he has experienced brokenness in his own life with his own father, but has experienced some breakthroughs, and he's learning how to support and how to strengthen and secure his breakthroughs. Would you welcome my good friend, Rick Willow? Thank you. I'm taking a, a big risk this morning or this afternoon, not by speaking, but by wearing this shirt. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm a follower of Jesus who struggles with performance, perfectionism, pride, and people-pleasing. I'm the firstborn child of two parents that met at Stanford. My mom's dad and her brothers were both dentists, and my dad became one too. So from the womb, I was expected to do just two things, go to Stanford and become a dentist. No problem. No pressure. My dad was popular and successful and always gone. My brother and I had babysitters all the time. Besides the business trips, dad was president of the PTA, the community theater, the Kiwanis Club. He founded and he sang barbershop with the Fresno Gold Note Chorus and in the church choir. We attended Episcopal Church, which is basically Catholic without confession, mostly so he could get to know the other influential people there. His friends adored him, and they told me I should grow up to be just like him. He became my idol, even my god. My father's constant absence left me feeling uncertain and insecure. I was only four when I began to realize that my father's love, affection, and attention were all focused on my performance. I feared his rejection and scorn. Once I showed him a report card I was really proud of. It had seven A's and one B on it. He said, son, what happened? B's won't get you into Stanford. I never let that happen again. In sixth grade, my world came crashing down. I'd hit a home run, and I thought we were going out for ice cream to celebrate. But on the way home, my dad, my idol, the person who was my god, told me he didn't love my mother anymore. He left us that night for a trophy wife, 21 years younger than he, and started a new family. In my anger, I couldn't admit that I felt like he left because he didn't love me either. I went from idolizing him 
to hating him. I wasn't a boy, but certainly not a man. And he was supposed to show me how to become one. There's one thing I was absolutely sure of. I wasn't going to be anything like him. I resolved that I would be faithful. And maybe that's the one good character trait that came out of all my pain. But I found myself drawn toward young women who needed someone to take care of them, to father them, and to be godlike to them. I thought I could be the man my father wasn't. And that's a sure plan for relational failure. I quit going to church. It didn't help my dad become a good person. I just decided I could do it all on my own, and I started living the gospel according to Rick. I just had to be better than everyone else, and I thought it wouldn't be that hard to do. I tried to avoid my dad just barely tolerating his visits. But then when I was 17, dad started going to a life-giving church. He started a personal relationship with Jesus, and he changed. There was something really different about him. He apologized for not being the dad he should have. By the time I was 19, I realized I did have a good, genuine father. He encouraged me. He was there for me. And I didn't know it, but he was praying for me every day. And he was showing me what Jesus Christ was like. During my second year at college, I was doing very well, but I felt completely empty. My successes just didn't matter. And when I finally told my dad how I was feeling, he simply asked if it was possible God was trying to tell me something. It was in that moment I realized I'd come full circle. Once again, I did want to be like my dad. I wanted to have what he had. So I started my new life with Jesus Christ. That was 40 years ago, and I realized my dad had become my best friend. Six years later, I met Joanne, a spiritually healthy woman who didn't need me to take care of her or be God to her. Dad was the best man at our wedding. My life was on a great path, but the damage from my childhood remained. I was a Christian who struggled with believing that Father God cared about what was going on in my life. I just thought he was too busy running the universe to be bothered, and that I had to perform to get his acceptance, too. I was a classic case of someone with a deep father wound. My dad was a new creation in Christ, but the consequences of his past, poor relational and business decisions, would ultimately cost him his health, most of his wealth, and then his life. My dad, now my brother in Christ and my best friend, died shortly after Joanne and I married. I was only 29. It helped knowing that he'd apologized to my mother and that I'd see him again. But I started feeling lost and abandoned. Again. My earthly father had left me, Again, and my Heavenly Father didn't stop it, and I wasn't processing any of it. I pulled away from Jesus and from my wife. I was angry, and I couldn't admit it. I was still that bruised little boy all over again who didn't have anyone to show him how to grow up or process grief in a healthy way. I said something harsh that made Joanne cry, and she said, I guess the honeymoon's over. That crushed me. I wasn't being faithful. So I chose to let my buried pain come up, and I told her about it. We cried and prayed together. That was an incremental breakthrough, but the long process of recovery started. And my spiritual, relational, and emotional inventories had begun. 26 years ago, CV Church got new pastors, and this young and enthusiastic couple showed me the way to a big breakthrough. Pastor Scott taught us how to recognize and deal with anger and the loss, the fears or the fear of loss that it stokes. I was 35, and I'd never admitted that anything made me angry. I might say, I'm confused, I'm frustrated, or I'm disappointed instead because being angry just felt completely out of control and my past drove me to try and stay in control of everything. I began to let the anger surface, but I didn't know how to deal with it and it began to impact our marriage again. Pastor Scott then asked me to consider the fears that were behind the anger, fear of loss, fear of failing, fear of rejection, Fear of consequences, fear of not being in control. 
I had many reasons to be angry. But why all those fears? Pastor Scott then helped me understand the incredible power a father has to build up his children or tear us down, to direct us on a path to security or insecurity. There were two main things I had to do for my major breakthrough. First, go to Jesus and admit my wound, that as a kid, my dad was not the father I should have had, that I was wounded trying to perform up to his impossible expectations, and second, to confess that I'd allowed those hurts to infect what I believed Father God was like. I had to ask God to forgive me for believing that he would treat me like my dad had. And then I asked Jesus to heal the damage my dad had done. You see, God can't heal it if you won't reveal it. <laughs> most of us grew up with imperfect fathers, and that means most of us have a father and perhaps a mother wound too. So on this day, we honor fathers I encourage you to honor Father God. Be honest with him about your father wound. Just reveal it, and he'll heal it. So as we close this afternoon, I want to ask you this. What barriers? What bondages, what blockages have you allowed to thwart your breakthroughs that your Heavenly Father has for you? If you've got an issue in your life that you say, no matter what I do, I can't get through this, I've got good news. I've been saying this for 11 weeks now. We've got one more week in this series. That you matter to Jesus Christ, and he has the power to help you make it. You can make the changes with his help. If you want to make it, he wants you to make it. I remember growing up, I had this overwhelming sense of being powerless and impotent, that it didn't matter what I do, what I said, what I did. It was never going to be enough. I remember when I married Kathy, I said, you and I will be fortunate if we're not homeless by the end of our marriage. I mean, that's how whacked I was. That's how damaged I was. Isn't that amazing? Now, thank God it's been taken care of. We might just end up in a tent, but it'll be okay. <laughs> but you can make the changes if you're willing to surrender your life to him and embrace his will. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your great love, and we thank you for Father's Day. I pray for all of my dear brothers and sisters and friends that are here today. Lord, if there's anyone still languishing over the pain of the past, I pray that they will run to you today. As the song that Whitney sings says, I will come home to you. I will come home to my Savior. I will come home to my deliverer. I will come home to my loving, compassionate, forgiving, accepting God. And Lord, we're very much aware in the story of the prodigal son that it, was when he, it wasn't until he hit his worst, where he was in the pig pen, eating the pig food. He looked and smelled like the pigs. And then it says he came to his senses. And he decided, I'm going to go home. I pray for anyone here who has been running from you, fighting you, resisting you, angry at you, blaming you, that you would help them to come to their end so that they will come to their senses and they will get up and they will go home. It's in your name we pray.